So who's behind this? I'm going to take a break from going through the law just to tell you something a little bit about who's behind it. Well, uh, you know, it's, I think we, we have to look at that. Um, you should have a, have a handout, um, which is um, this one, what is sexuality, sex education, and it's background information, Alfred Kinsey. I think that's pretty important. Um, and so you, you really, I'm not, I can't go take the time to go into a lot of that right here. And there's also a YouTube presentation um, that um, is on our YouTube um, um, page and you can just do a search for, um, go on the videos uh, on our page and, and it'll come up. But in, in any case, you have to give recognition to Alfred Kinsey. <clears throat> he was really the foundation of it. And he's a sex deviant who, uh, whose research uh, was based on intentional fraud. It promoted the sexual rights of children to open the way for pedophilia. So the Kinsey Institute, Planned Parenthood, CECUS, those are some of the key foundations of comprehensive sex ed. It's derived from the Kinsey CECUS Planned Parenthood Network. CECUS was established as the sex education arm of the Kinsey Institute, which is Alfred Kinsey. So here you go, the Planned Parenthood, Dr. Mary Calderon left her medical director position at Planned Parenthood and became the first director of CECUS in 1964. So she was on a Channel 9 TV interview in 1968, and these are the things she was saying at that point. She said she denounced the teachings of the Bible as myths, the whole religion relationship of, of um, man to woman, she said, must be changed. Adolescent sexual experimentation is not just inevitable, but it is actually necessary for normal development. She promoted sexual freedom for kids over parental rights. Sikas was formed to teach human sexuality, she said, with awareness of the vital importance of infant and childhood sexuality. Here we go, we have something from CECUS, the Sexuality Education and Information Consortium. This was put out in January of this year. They've, come, they've become much more out. Sex ed is a vehicle for social change. This is what they're promoting now, and this is what it's always been, but now they're telling uh, political activists that this is what it is. What does it mean? So this is a quote from them. All of this is right out of their material, except for what's in, in the uh, brackets here. While sex education is a necessary sexual health tool, it can and should be so much more than that. With sex education, we have a golden opportunity to create a culture shift, tackling the misinformation, shame, and stigma that create the basis for many of today's sexual and reproductive health and rights issues like abortion, they call it reproductive justice, LGBT equality, and there we've seen already what they, what, uh, they believe all sexual orientations must be normalized, including all of transgender, sexual violence prevention, which it doesn't, gender equity, I mean, it, it claims to, but it doesn't actually prevent anything, gender equity, which is gender fluid ideology, and dismantling white supremacy. Now, um, it's important for people to recognize that the promoters of comprehensive sex education see this as a political movement to transform our culture. And so, um, you know, we sometimes think of it as, um, you know, as just sex education and it's bad stuff and it does more than it should and blah, blah, blah. This is a deliberate strategy for radical social change. We do not have a white supremacist system, but it, 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 it uh, imp implies, it assumes that we, through, uh, through transforming students, are, are dismantling a system. Uh, that's basically our free republic that they're talking about. That's what they're dismantling here. Julie, I want to um, just add one thing on preventing sexual violence. If you are teaching children that all forms of sexuality are perfectly norm normal, it's all okay, and that you have a right to it all, and then you 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 tell children that it's all okay as long as the other person consents. Where is the self-constraint? Where is the self-control being taught? And so the, it just opens the door for sexual violence much, you know, rather than prevent it. Exactly, thank you. I'm moving on to CECUS's strategic framework. Now this uh, information on the screen 
is straight out of their information, word for word. It's all their, their strategic framework under the title, under the, <clears throat> the area of values. SICUS advances comprehensive sexuality education as a means of building a foundation for a long-term culture shift that will positively, they say, impact all levels of society, particularly issues of gender equity, sexuality, sexual reproductive health, consent, personal safety, and autonomy. They, I mean, my question is, and okay, this bill was introduced and it was passed in the House without the public even knowing that it was up for debate, much less that had they known it was up for debate, who would have told them that the promoters of comprehensive sex, ed sex education see this as a way to have a culture shift? Whose culture are they shifting? And to what culture are they shifting? We have a right to know. We have a right to be told, since this is the agenda, of those wanting to pass this bill, what culture are you shifting away from? Well, they will tell you it's the white supremacist, they will tell you the racist, they will tell you it's the sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic, all of that they are shifting away from, which is simply a war against our constitutional, free constitutional republic. That is what this is. This is a war against us at the very fundamental level by transforming our children from pre-K through 12. Values again, CECUS uses a rights-based framework, we've seen what that means, to inform our approach reshaping cultural and societal narratives of sexuality and sexual and reproductive health. There you go. This is not about just teaching biology and equipping the kids as they say to, you know, know what it is and, you know, this is reshaping entire society in their view. Back to International Planned Parenthood exclaim, it is important for all young people around the world to be able to explore, experience, and express their sexuality. This can only happen when young people's sexual rights are guaranteed. Here I say, with Planned Parenthood, there's no such thing as right or wrong when it comes to sexuality, all value free. They teach a truly radical philosophy of sexuality to our children, beginning at birth, they believe they're sexual. Do you think that maybe they are wading into the, you know, creating the foundation for pedophilia? I think so. Sexual rights, like all human rights, are universal, inalienable, indivisible. And this is them, again, the roots of the matter. This is all their stuff. Sexuality is an integral part of being human for all young people. Sexuality and sexual pleasure are important for all young people. That means they want to get them involved. They want to sexualize them, irrespective of reproductive desires. The evolving capacities of children and young people must be recognizing. Children and young people. They're talking about children, not just teens. Oh, teens are children, but they're going younger than that. And they say, what is sexual pleasure? And they start talking about what it is for them. Then at the bottom again, young people's sexual rights are human rights. That's all their stuff. All right, going on. B, the model program must include... Number two, oh, we, we, or consent, we did consent, bodily autonomy, including, okay, healthy relationships, including relationships involving diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. So all public charter schools must present diverse sexual orientations and gender identities as healthy and normal relationships from pre-K and up. And in California, I mean, she, Karen Anglin was, was telling us, showing us, the curriculum that is having, you know, toddlers, uh, pre-K, uh, you know, learning that they are not a boy or a girl uh, uh, based on what they look like. Uh, they, um, they should explore, uh, you know, whether, what gender they really are. So you can imagine how this impacts children. 
let me give you an example of the diverse orientations and sexual identities. They're in the schools right now. Okay, this is Valley View Middle School, Bloomington. They have, this is one of their, this all, look at that, all on the hall. This is, this one right here is blown up over here. We, the gays, what is GSA? Gender, what is GSA, Michelle? I can't remember. Um, gay sexuality, I don't know. It's the, it's a, it's the LGBT group. It, it used to be the Gay Straight Alliance, but yes. I think the, the, um, the promoters of that kind of stuff are, have changed that, but, but originally it was Gay Straight Alliance. Yeah, they have a different, it's an acronym for a little bit different. We at the GSA at Valley View Middle School feel that everyone should be accepted no matter their sexual orientation or gender identification. So here they're promoting gender fluid, not even just, you know, you can choose yours. You can, you know, you can go back and forth. <laughs> a person who does not identify themselves as having a fixed gender is gender fluid. Someone who is gender fluid may identify as one gender one day and a different gender the next day. Okay. GSA supports everyone's right to be who they are. Uh, and then there are all kinds of others down here, which I'm not going to take the time to show you what they individually are. Might be a good idea. To, uh, at least I think it's important to distinguish here when, when they talk about uh, everyone should be accepted. Um, let's not conflate the golden rule with medical science here. Nobody's disputing, and we would love to have a, a conversation in schools about the morality of the golden rule, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about science. We're talking about the health of children and protecting them for a future, you know, that, um, that, is, that is healthy and worth living, not a future of, of being objectified for your, your sex, of being used because somebody else thinks they're entitled to sex. You know, this has nothing to do with the golden rule, but they constantly throw that around. Everybody should be accepted and feel safe as a way to uh, bring in this kind of ideology. And it's important for us, I think, when that happens to push back and say, we're happy to have the conversation about the golden rule, but that's not what this is about. Exactly. And um, I will mention too, that up here where it says, um, everyone should feel accepted, it says we provide a safe environment for all students and take a strong stance against bullying. Okay, and that's where we were very much trying to inform everybody what the bullying bill really was about. It meant we knew that this is what they were bringing in, that they were going to supposedly protect kids from bullying by indoctrinating them into this ideology that is dangerous for them and unhealthy and extremely uh, harmful to them. Going on, <clears throat> the model program uh, must include uh, information that is age and developmentally appropriate on, number three, abstinence and other methods for preventing unintended pregnancy and sexually transmitted infection, uh, in, infections. Um, and so the fact is, <laughs> Comprehensive sex education curriculum gives a very short trip to abstinence as an actual, like, credible option. We have had, um, we've heard from a couple of different people who used to teach comprehensive sex education and have left it, that the assumption of comprehensive sex education training is that people will be sexually active. And I'll go so far as to say, according to Planned Parenthood, they should be because it's healthy. Um, and that's why they assume that they will be. So when you have that as the underlying assumption of your training, and then you say, oh, by the way, the only sure, uh, safe, sure safe way completely is abstinence. I mean, you're talking, you're just blowing smoke. So here is the Department of Health, Minnesota's Department of Health. And these are uh, the curriculum that they're promoting. This is called Making Proud Choices. And Making Proud Choices is... Um, here it, it described, this is their, on the Minnesota Department of Health, their, their summary of Making Proud Choices says, the curriculum acknowledges that abstinence is the most effective way to eliminate these risks, but also encourages the practice of safe, encourages the practice of safer sex and condom use and gives youth a foster care, in foster care, the confidence they need to choose and negotiate 
safer sex. The, uh, they, they want you to choose <laughs> safer sex practices. Safer sex means something other than abstinence. So they're basically dismissing abstinence. Okay, I wrote it a little bit bigger down here. It's just what I read here. Analysis, there's an analysis of making proud choices at the comprehensive sex, sexualityeducation.org. There's a lot of information on that website. And in this, they, 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 are, they, they uh, do an analysis of a number of different uh, curriculum. And this one, they say, is essentially, they say making proud choices is essentially a how-to manual for sexual activity. That is what it is. It implies that many, if not most, teenagers are sexually active, and it teaches them how to negotiate condom use and obtain consent for sex. It accepts diverse sexual orientations and gender identities and even contains same-sex role-playing scenarios for teens to act out. It encourages detailed condom demonstrations using penis models and suggests ways to make condom use more pleasurable. And that is what's being promoted on our Minnesota Department of Health. Analysis goes on. This, uh, this curriculum includes DVDs with sexual discussions among teenagers and lessons on reducing the risk of STDs, not on eliminating the risk by practicing abstinence. One video contains animated steps to condom use, including animated figures acting out vaginal, anal, and oral sex. This curriculum claims to be evidence-based. However, the one and only study cited by the facilitator's manual was done by the authors themselves, presenting an extreme conflict of interest. Now you notice where it is being implemented, Minnesota is included. So the target group, ages uh, 12 to 18. Um, uh, Evidence-based, see there you get that language, they throw this stuff in, you know, they, age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, medically accurate, evidence-based. It's just trashy language. It just means it, they have absolutely undermined any meaningful definition of those words. But it, it gives them cover for doing what they want to do. It's evidence-based. It's not evidence-based. You know, they're saying, you know, this, this, this example of the one and only study, and it is done by the authors themselves, that is typical of the kind of research that is behind comprehensive sex education. It is not substantiated by any evidence, but, you, but they'll put it out there as they've got all this evidence and it ends up being nothing much more than this. The model program must include notification to, and these two provisions were added by some of the opponents of CSE because they knew it was gonna pass and they figured that maybe improve some things in it. Criminal penalties and, you know, letting them know that there are criminal penalties for engaging in sexual conduct with minors and the unavail unavailability of mistake as to age or consent of the minor as the defense. They wanted them required to notify both the students and the employees. I wonder if they'll follow that law. School employees and administrators they must inform them that a teacher or administrator who engages in sexual contact with a student may be found in violation of the student code of ethics and revocation of their teacher license. Um, you know, you may not be aware of it, but there is a explosion of, of sex abuse of teachers to students. Um, it's just going on. I mean, you, you get a lot of reports of it here and there, but the media really almost never covers it. And they've done a good, I mean, the media has just done a real huge uh, uh, propaganda, you might say, of how terrible uh, the Catholic Church has been with their uh, abuse, child abuse, sexual abuse. You know, if they would apply that same standard to the schools, we would be shocked. But you never, it's, it, you never get that standard applied to teachers uh, who are engaging in sexual abuse with students. I don't mean to malign teachers because most teachers don't like that. And we have a lot of respect for most teachers. Uh, but the fact is that this is becoming rampant. And the reason that um, the, the people who have gone after the Catholic Church and sued them uh, for that horrendous behavior and not sued the public schools is because you can't sue the public schools. 
And so a lot of what's going on in the schools is getting hidden, but there isn't the same motivation to go after it because for the plaintiffs, there isn't the same monetary um, reward. And that's not to say that the people that, that are victims of that of those crimes should be should be compensated. I'm just saying that there isn't there isn't the motivation because they they can't get a monetary judgment. And I also wanted to mention, as far as these two um, uh, parts that were these two provisions that were added, is that um, it the the proponents of the bill, you know they're not gonna vote against this because it makes them look bad. I mean, they wouldn't have added it, but you know, it's up for a vote. So, you know, they agreed to add it. They figured they could live with it, even though it's not something they would willingly add to it if they could. Okay, um, starting in 22, a school district or charter school must implement a comprehensive sexual health, sexual health education program for students in elementary and secondary school including students with disabilities, et cetera. They, uh, it must include instruction on the topics listed in subdivision one. Well, that's what we just went through. So they must have a curriculum like this. It must include all the things that we just went through. This is a mandate to every school district. The state is legislating what comprehensive sex education curriculum must teach that is a and and they must provide the the supporting material for it that is a curriculum and it is a mandate so if anybody tells you it's not a mandate point them to this it must include instructions on the topic or the sexual program that they adopt must include instruction on the topics listed in subdivision one and must respect community values that really gets me and encourage students to communicate blah 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 and other instructed about sexuality and intimate relationships. Okay, while they're driving a wedge between um, students and their parents and their families by saying they have the right to uh, do to become sexual, then they're saying, oh, and, um, and, and make sure you talk to your trusted adults. Well, you know, the fact is, if their parents don't, uh, don't approve of it, I mean, they're not a trusted adult, according to this uh, way of thinking. But the, commu the respect community values, um, how does this mandate respect community values? I mean, whose values? And how did they determine what values are community values? We've already determined from what they said that they have their own agenda on what their values are. And they're trying to transform community values. They're trying to undermine community values. The entire CSE mandate is a violation of community values. Teaching children graphic, dangerous, unhealthy, explicit sexual acts, and teaching them that they have the right to be sexually active, free of parental authority. In what way does that respect community values? This is the way, this is so deceptive because they throw in this language to cover up what this really is. And I have seen, I have heard defenders of this say, Oh, it says right in there we have to respect community values. Oh, did they, did they have town halls? Did they invite people in? Did they ask for comments? They never even know, notified the public that this was up for a vote, nor did the media, who is completely complicit in keeping this quiet. Community doesn't know. That's not respecting community values. That's one of the most outrageous statements in the law. It must respond to culturally diverse individuals, okay? Um, they must, uh, okay, so the respect is for diversity. I mean, they must respond to culturally diverse individuals. They must respect and respond to that. It's for diversity. It's not for, our, for, for America's traditional sexual mores. That's who they're respecting is the diverse. Well, diverse, uh, to many of us, the diversity is immoral behavior. And we, that is our values. There is a moral, there is moral and immoral behavior. And um, it also must provide students with information about local resources where students can obtain medically accurate information. There you go, medically accurate. And services. <clears throat> so who are the local resources? 
on parenthood. They're the ones, I mean, they say themselves, they're the, you know, the biggest teacher, promoter of sexual education, comprehensive sex education in the state. Gender activist troops, of course they're going to be, they are the ones who know all about this because it's their agenda that's here. They are the resources. Here's Tumblr, Planned Parenthood. It says here, Tumblr was the most popular with the teens and college-aged user segments, with half of Tumblr's visitor base being under the age of 25. So here's what they say. Since the number of sexual partners you've had doesn't say anything about your character, your morals, or your personality, or about anything at all, really, there's nothing bad or unhealthy about having a big number of sexual partners. That's respecting diversity. And when they call, they say people shouldn't be shamed. And that's not in the bill, but that's what the narrative is that 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 a sex education that uh, that doesn't um, respect the right of of of, of uh, young people to be sexual is a shaming. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is the way they don't shame people. They say it's all good, it's all okay. There's nothing bad, nothing bad or unhealthy about it. And that is a vicious, vicious lie to our children. Here, this is Planned Parenthood's, uh, they call it happy, healthy, and something. I've got it down here. Happy, oh, here it is. Healthy, happy, and hot. A young person's guide to their rights, sexuality, and living with HIV. So this is a different, this is again, International Planned Parenthood. It's all about young people living with HIV. They have a right to decide if, when, and how to disclose their HIV status. Okay, there I have it to the right here. Young people living with HIV. This is, their, this is a picture. This is a um, you know, just a capture of what they have are in their curriculum. Down here, you know best if and when it is safe for you to disclose your status. Okay, sharing your HIV status is called disclosure, your decision, etc. If you have paid any attention to the recent uh, town hall that CNN did with the Democrat candidates for president, you will see that um, the, they, they had it about, it was the LGBT issue. Those town hall was focused just on that. And that came, became an issue is whether, because there are some states that um, are trying to uh, remove laws that make it criminal to, um, to expose somebody unknowingly to a STI or to a HIV status. And so it's become controversial to make it illegal. And um, to a person, all of the Democratic candidates are actually opposed to it being illegal. And um, <laughs> it's pretty shocking. And what people don't really realize is that Planned Parenthood is teaching this very thing to our young people. Here we have it again. Sex can feel great and can be really fun. Many people think sex is just about vaginal or anal intercourse, but there are lots of different ways to have sex and lots of different types of sex. And then it gives you some examples of how things are sexual. Some people like to have aggressive sex, while others like to have soft and blah, blah, blah. There is no right or wrong way to have sex. Just have fun, explore. So you are, here we have Planned Parenthood inviting, encouraging our kids to become participants in very dangerous behaviors. I'd like to ask the question too, how does this build strong marriages and families? It destroys future relationships because it sexualizes them so early. It undermines their integrity if it's any kind of sex anywhere, anytime with anyone is just fine, and you learn that in an early age, how are you going to have a committed, respectful relationship with one person that you marry? 
And it's, it's, it's just destroys marriage and it is an attack on their future children. But it, here doesn't, you have it doesn't even meet the standard in the proposed legislation regarding healthy relationships. I mean, if, if, we, that, if that's the lowest bar that they're trying to reach, this is far below that. Just have fun. Explore and be yourself. Sexual pleasure. This is there. Look at that. They've got a banner. Sexual pleasure. Young people living with HIV have the right to sexual pleasure. I mean, you, I just, it's, it's shocking. Okay, going back to CECAS under their strategic framework and values. This is their language again. CECAS commits to working to dismantle the systems of power and oppression, which perpetuate disparate sexual and reproductive health outcomes and incubate stigma and shame around sex. If you're sexually promiscuous, there should be no stigma and no shame and sexuality across intersections of age. Look at that. Intersections of age. Hey guys, that's laying the foundation for pedophilia. Race. I, I saw an article recently that referred to uh, the new phrase that's coming up regarding pedophilia and they called it age gap attraction. Age gap attraction. Just another name for the same thing. And I've seen it also referenced as minor attracted people, MAP, minor attracted people. And as uh, Jaco Bullions told us, told us the other night, I saw a presentation by him and he's, you know, he's a great um, uh, opposition to, to child sex trafficking. He's done incredible work. But one of the things he said is there is a bill out there floating around uh, that hasn't been introduced anywhere yet, but he's seen the bill proposed, which um, makes pedophilia a sexual orientation. Therefore, it would receive, if, if it becomes a sexual orientation, it has protected legal status. Um, so anyway, the, the um, CECAS is committed to dismantling the systems of power and oppression over gender identity, sexual orientation, and ability. So again, this system of power and oppression is what they see. This is their lens to view our constitutional republic. This is what they're undermining. It is a Marxist agenda under the guise of sex education. Here they are, shape cultural and, and societal narratives by applying a multifaceted approach in all communications with a strong organizational website, social media presence, relevant. Okay, so this is their plan, their strategic communications that they plan to put this out. They're very, very aggressive. They're very well funded. I'm sure they're, they're funded by George Soros as well as other major corporate interests. Here's what they say, uh, moving into 2019. This came out in um, December, actually. We recognize that we are far from ensuring that every young person receives the sex education they need the kind that dismantles white supremacy and gender inequities and inf affirms identities and experiences stretch beyond binaries and heteronormative expectations. It's all there. The, and I'm, look, I'm up here is a quote from the bill. The sexual health education program must respect community values. Oh, really? So dismantling white supremacy and gender inequities. Is that that's community values? I don't think so. Here they are again. CECAS influences policymakers and educators through their national sexuality education standards and national teacher preparation standards. They are the largest promoter of comprehensive sex education in the country. And here you have a uh, tweet from them. Somebody down here says, question three, what is required to build power in spite of the forces of white supremacy, anti-blackness, patriarchy, racism, xenophobia, that means that we respect our borders, and other conspiring against people of color. And his, and the answer Sikas gives is, we need to prioritize educating young people about all of these concepts early on. Sex education is a golden opportunity to teach youth about dismantling systems of power and oppression that perpetuate white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, and more. It's a revolutionary a strategy. For, it's a strategy for revolutionary change. It's a Marxist revolution is what it is, and they're saying it outright. It's 
school programs, a school or charter school that does not adopt the model program developed by the Commissioner of Education in accordance with subdivision one must submit for approval to the Commissioner of Education a sexual health education program, the one that they decide to use. The commissioner must require a district applying for approval under this paragraph to include the following information. Okay, so the, quote, the fact of the matter is, it has to be approved by the Department of Education and it must comply with the state law. So everything that we have been through that said what it must include must be included in whatever curriculum that the uh, district decides to choose. So what they tell us is that this isn't a mandate. They tell us that this law um, allows the school districts to choose their own. And the fact of the matter is, it must be a replica in most, in, uh, in all the important issues of uh, what is required in the law. So if the commissioner has to approve it, you are not choosing it. And if the state determines what must be in it, you are not determining it. So it's, it's very deceptive. It's very disingenuous for anyone to say that this is not a mandate that school districts may develop their own curriculum. Just simply untrue. Okay, so that must include the following information. The written materials that they'll use, the training that will provide, blah, blah, and all that. The school district that adopts the model program uh, in accordance with subdivision one, that's, you know, everything that has to be in it, must report which program is selected to the commissioner. So it's just same, more of the same. All right, here you have, um, there. this is where Planned Parenthood comes into the school room. Notwithstanding any law to the contrary, instruction in a sexual education program under this section may be provided by a person without a teaching license who is employed by the school district charter school or by a community organization if the school district administration determines the school employee or community organization has necessary content expertise. Well, who has, comprehens has expertise in comprehensive sex education? Who has content expertise, expertise in LGBT ideology? Unlicensed Planned Parenthood and gender activist teachers and organizations are allowed into the classroom to teach CSE. And I will mention that one of the, the fact is that uh, probably the majority of employed teachers would not feel comfortable teaching what they're required to teach. And for that reason, uh, they would be more than happy to have somebody else come in so that they don't have to do it. It's a, it's an, uh, uh, you know, to teach this stuff to the kids is just a violation of the children. Many teachers just would not want to do it. And here we have parental review. A school district or charter school must provide instruction under the section consistent with the parental curriculum review requirements, 120B.20. This is the parental opt out. The fact is that CSE is a dangerous violation of our children. And I want you to know that opting out is almost impossible because it is incorporated into many subjects. It's not just one class. It includes LGBT history and history class. It includes teaching, incorporating this into examples in math. It includes in, you know, uh, normalizing this stuff in social studies. It includes incorporating it into the literature that they're reading. You can't opt out out of that. Sometimes you can get a hold of a particular book that's a particular bag and you can say you don't want your kid to read it and then you have to struggle and struggle and maybe you will, maybe you won't. But it is almost impossible. In fact, I would say it is impossible to opt out of this. You can opt out of a particular class, but the whole ideology has, has, taken, a, has taken over in the school and it will be everywhere. It'll be in the hallways like we've seen. It will be... Uh, well, we've, we've seen in, in one school, there are a number of schools that do that, but it, it'll be everywhere. And you're not going to be able to opt your children out. Besides that, most parents just have no idea, and you know that, about what's going on in the classroom. And they don't want to believe it, and they don't want to be critical, and they've got a lot of other things on their minds. They're not going to track this stuff. 
And the most vulnerable students are the ones that have no one to speak for them. No one's going to opt them out because they're too, and they come from, from compromised backgrounds. I mean, they may have, they have single parents, which makes it very difficult. They may, they, they may have turmoil in their homes, uh, you know, no matter what. So this, this parental opt out, um, it's nice for you to opt your kids out if you have kids in public school, and I would recommend it. But don't think, if this is a panacea, don't think this is an answer to it. When our children in our schools and our communities are being violated this way, it is a violation of them. We can't be quiet and say, well, I won't let my child be involved and therefore I'm done with this. Oh no, we have a responsibility. We are the taxpayers. These are our schools. And for us to allow this for anybody, I don't have kids in the public schools. My kids are grown up. I all have their own kids. I only have a couple of many that are in a public school at all. Do I, do I go by, you know, whether they will be able to opt out? It, 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 this, is a, this is a cultural attack, a huge cultural attack. And we can't see this as a panacea, which the proponents will tell you. They will say, oh, you can opt out. If you don't like it, opt out. That's the end of that. I just want to tell you a couple things about what's mm -hmm. taking hold in the schools. It's called transformative, transformational education. And this is from a director of transformational learning. Um, here's his quote, transformational learning involves experiencing a deep structural shift in the basic premises of thought, feelings, and actions. It is a shift of consciousness that dramatically and permanently alters our way of being in the world. This narrative has taken over the entire education system in our country. I want you to know that. It is absolutely what drives Minnesota's education system. It drives it at the federal level, at the state level, and um, most often at the local level. Such a shift involves our understanding of relations of power in interlocking structures of class, race, and gender. This is a Marxist revolution. As educators, we are not purveyors of knowledge. We are designers and participants in environments and processes. This, you know, academics is not what education is about these days. And I just want to quickly go through on Tundra Ground, in case you um, uh, would like to have a little more background. There's more of it on our, <clears throat> on our YouTube. There's, there's a, a, a whole webinar on this. Who is the father of transformational education? He's an Italian Stalinist writing in the 30s. It's culture, not economics, is the center of revolution. The group that controls social institutions controls the rest of society, and political power is built on cultural power. So that's what we're talking about. It's the culture war. He was about the father of that. Um, and that's what we're dealing with here. The goal of transformational education, according to Graham G., the goal is the total transformation of culture and society in order to create the worldwide Marxist state. And that's a quote from uh, the book that my husband uh, wrote, it was published in 2005, but it's very appropriate now, America's Schools. So way forward. Um, I, want, I, I, I want to just recommend that um, we, we're going to do uh, more on things that you can do. Um, we're going to be putting out ideas on how you can uh, proceed, how you can set up uh, meetings with your legislators or school board members. Uh, but you can see that if you can, if you can get a better understanding of this, uh, then I think... Um, you're, you're, you're then equipped to talk to people about it. You can give them that card. Those cards are really important, those handouts. But then you can give them a little bit more background. And uh, there are many ways that you can be communicating this to people, but we have to have this permeate the entire culture in Minnesota so we understand how our children are under intense attack and they are losing our children to bring down our culture. I think that's it, Michelle. Great job, Julie. Um, stay tuned, friends. We'll have more for you. And thanks for joining us in this fight.